Thank you so much for the brief, kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I call this Hora de Peligro. Everybody knows about that. I stand between you and your lunch. You know, when Michael Moon invited me to this forum, I said, I don't know whether I am competent to be able to do this because I have to make some uh, confessions. First, I am a digital immigrant. But I feel some comfort because uh, I think a, probably a good 25 to 30 percent in this room are probably digital immigrants as well. Right? I am probably what you might call a tradigitalist. I am low tech. But I do have experience more than 20 years that dates me because I have been in the export sector, both on the private sector side and the government side. And I have been able to experience the times when uh, I asked my buyers to open full text cable authenticated letters of credit. I don't even know if that's being done now. Uh, probably a good half of the audience here probably does not even know what a telex machine is. Yes, I get that reply, I get that response. Yeah, I used to almost sleep with a telex machine. And when the fax machine came about, I thought it was heaven already. <laughs> yeah, because I was in the marketing of food products and how do you describe a label using a telex machine? Okay, so when the fax machine was there, I thought everything would be perfect. Now, i just like to uh, uh, put also other uh, caveats here. I, uh, for the purpose of uh, being able to convey to you the message that I have uh, for you this noon, uh, I, I borrowed heavily from McKinsey Global Institute, uh, the MGI's report on digital globalization, uh, the new era of global flows, and the future of trade recently published by Dubai Multi Commodities Center or the MCC. So what you're going to hear uh, this afternoon is actually uh, what I teach exporters. And I think maybe that's probably what uh, got Michael into inviting me for some reason, because we were together also uh, at the forum with the European, uh, the, the European Economic Chamber of Commerce and Industry last year. Uh, that said, let me begin with... All right. You guys know him. Globalization must be taken for granted. There will only be one standard for corporate success, international market share. The winning corporations will win by finding markets all over the world. Another thought leader, there is no longer such a thing as a purely national economy. The rest of the world is just too big to ignore, either as a market or as a competitor. And if business schools, and actually we could change that with SWIFT, or we can, we, can, we can change that to Bankers Association of the Philippines, or we can change that to business support organizations, do nothing other than to train their members or their clients to think internationally, they would have accomplished an important task, right? So please take a look around you the person beside you, to your left, to your right, behind you, and in front of you. They are either your market or your competitor, right? <laughs> right? Okay, now try multiplying that about seven billion times in an interconnected world, right? Now this is even more compelling. A company that masters only its domestic market will eventually Lose it. Strong foreign competitors will come in and challenge your company. It is now business without borders. Okay? Now, this is classic globalization. Classic globalization. It is classic analog globalization. But it has brought about the likes of Barbinomics. Right? Barbinomics? Remember Barbinomics? Okay, it used to be, Barbie doll used to be made only in one place in the world, that's in California. Okay, a few decades later, where is Barbie made, where is Barbie doll made? Well, I'll just get to the point. 
I have it in good authority that the Philippines used to produce the perfectly shaped left leg of the Barbie doll. <laughs> we've, seen, <laughs> we've since gone forward and we're doing other things. And so we are now going to show you, sorry, that's too quick. Put that back, all right? Ah, that's too bad, it's already there. Okay, we have the Airbus 78, uh, sorry, the, the Airbus, uh, uh, the, the Boeing 787, okay, the Dreamliner, and you can see all the flags, okay, that make this product. So from a toy to aircraft, now that kind of product, just like the Barbie doll, is not made just anywhere. It is made in the world. Question, is the Philippines in there? The answer is yes. In fact, Baguio is there, Baguio City in the Philippines there, by a company called Mo Control Industries. Okay, we happen to supply, the Philippines happens to, to supply, the servo actuators that actually make airplanes take off and land. Now, how's comfort? how comfortable are you with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, why are we not seeing the flag of the Philippines? And this is very important. We're not seeing the flag of the Philippines because of policies, non-disclosure agreements, right? Those don't factor anymore into that. Right? So, uh, again, uh, well, I will try to, to, to show you later on uh, with an AVP what I'm talking about. All right. That said, you know, flow of goods, flow of services, in today's day and age, it's really more trade in value added. The Philippines, for example, and we're talking about ASEAN, the Philippines, believe it or not, is a net exporter of frozen smoked salmon. Yes. We import frozen salmon from New Zealand, process it in General Santos, and we re-export it to other ASEAN partner economies, such as, I mean, Japan and Korea, at zero duty. Both ways. The import of the salmon raw material and the export. So we're actually competing with the likes of Norway, Sweden, in major markets for frozen smoked salmon. Now that said, that's really analog so far. This is even more interesting, and I see some people here who are probably going to qualify. You know, this was required reading of us when we were at UP, English 1. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hans Sikert is smiling. You probably are part of this, right? <laughs> it's called the, Me the Medium of the Message by Marshall McLuhan. Okay? And he said, even as early as 1967, that the new electronic interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global village. Wala pa hong internet nun. Paano niya nalaman yun? Right? Today, nearly 43% of the world is connected to the internet, enabling us to talk, share photos, and conduct business halfway across the globe. And as a result, we have seen more technological advancements in the last 10 years than we've witnessed in the past well, not we, that has been witnessed in the past 10,000 years. And in the next five years, we'll see even more advancements. What's the point? Globalization is already there. Some resistance, sometimes uh, it's also going very fast. Governments participate by negotiating trade deals. But what's really driving it? It's really technology. It's really technology. And I, as a marketing person, I have to show you this. Oops. Ah, this clicker is making my... <laughs> oh. Am I doing that or somebody else is doing that for me? <laughs> All right. Uh, if, we, we will, if you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay, among the marketing mix variables, price has always been a central consideration. And this year and the next years will be no exceptions despite the gradual recovery in incomes in global markets. As economic woes continue to weigh in on large markets like China, Japan, Russia, Brazil, a new wave of emerging market consumers is becoming more bearish in outlook. Mobile commerce, or M-commerce, enables shoppers to compare prices of almost any product, while peer reviews on social media empower them to further. 
at the touch of a button or a swipe of your cell phone, you can identify the best product, best for your needs, and decide where to buy it at the best price. Hence, what, we are, what are we saying? Retail profit margins will continue to slide. Take this for an example. Before 2009, the world's largest retailer, Walmart, achieved a profit margin of 3 to 4 percent. But by October last year, 2015, it was reported that this had sunk to a low of 2.8 percent. In Europe as well, the chief financial officer of Sainsbury's, which faces its own declines, has predicted that margins for grocery retail, once as high as 5 percent, will now fall to around 3 percent. Retailers will have to seek uh, to harness lower prices, trying to generate site traffic through more intense and longer sales seasons. In the U.S., for example, sales dates during the festive season, you know about Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Super Saturday, and Manic Monday, they're already blurring. And you know, I never realized that my birth date was going to be very, very significant. I happened to be born on November 11. And what's November 11? In 2015, that date will be remembered as the single day where Alibaba sold more than 14 billion US dollars in one single day. Actually, they could have sold more, except they had to shut down the site already. And that makes my birthday even more significant, doesn't it? Now, what are we pointing out here? That's Maslow, classic, analog. Okay, I said maybe about 70% of people here are millennials. So before physiological, hindi lang yan, pati yung mga ate natin, mga yaya, di ba? It's no longer physiological. First, do I have load? <laughs> right? Right? What's your biggest fear, the millennials here? Well, they used to call it FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Okay? These days, it's now FOBO. What is that? Fear of being offline. <laughs> so we, we, we continue, and, and you will see that uh, the, after the Internet of Things, you have the Internet of Everything, but more importantly now, it's really the Internet of Me. Okay? Because of technology, everything can actually be customized, personalized. You, pinpoint, rifle approach. No shotgun approach, approach now for marketers. All right. So consumers, devices, and things now become more and more connected, and the possibilities in terms of what could be leveraged as a vehicle for enabling commerce are endless. In time, the idea of a smartphone as a, uh, as a commerce device could be old news as commerce moves beyond simply portable consumer devices. From the ring on your finger to the fridge in your kitchen, players across the ecosystem are exploring ways to embed what was seen to be futuristic commerce applications for, uh, into everyday items. For example, most recently, MasterCard unveiled a new app that will enable consumers to shop for food from a 21.5-inch full high-definition LCD touchscreen on Samsung. I'm not exactly sure whether they launched it already, but I think they did. My source is uh, Euromonitor. It's called the Family Hub Refrigerator. Consumers can use the touch screen to update calendars, leave notes, and order groceries through two partners, including Fresh Direct and ShopOrite. MasterCard says the app will learn the family's shopping habits, which will enable it to eventually suggest commonly purchased groceries when the family supply is running low. All right. Now, global consumers will even be more connected in 2016 and beyond. The number of global internet users will cross the threshold of 3 billion for the first time in history. Consumers can now leverage a variety of devices to connect the internet, including computers, tablets, mobile phones, wearables, you know, the internet of things. More than half of global households are, going, are projected to have access to an internet-enabled computer this year, with 91% of households expected to have access to a mobile phone. Customization will be key. Whether digital natives or digital immigrants, the point is that marketers must be able to deliver and sustain the desired consumer journey or experience tailor-made to the individual. 
Please remember that even using Maslow's hierarchy of needs, each of those layers are touch points for the consumer. So we must be able to satisfy each of those layers, not the least of which will be the internet of me. Which this reminds me, for example, nowadays, you know, you have wearables. Okay? So nothing can be more personal than wearables. In uh, last year's a consumer electronic, electronic show in Las Vegas, for example, uh, Mr. Sean uh, Dubra, Dubravac, you know, he heads the Consumer Electronics Association, he said, you know, the key to all this is that something, uh, something, ha uh, it, something that happens in the physical space, okay, because of the Internet of Things, are digitized and we are able to feed it back to the physical space again. Talk about algorithms, okay? And no longer is the focus what is technologically possible. What is more important is what is technologically meaningful. And this reminds me when Jack Ma was here for the APEC conference last year. You know, um, on the sidelines, he was talking about, you know, what made, and he, you know, that guy was not, he's also a digital immigrant, basically. And he says, you know, I'm not tech savvy when I started this. And, and he was talking about, you know, there was a time when it was the age of information. There was the age of the, uh, the IQ, you know. IQ is important, information. EQ is important. But right now he says, what is the ambition or what is the aspiration of Alibaba? Is to have LQ. And we said, lover's quarrel? <laughs> no. He said, love quotient. It is how to be able to relate the consumer to the provider of service or product. So the challenge to marketers in the digital economy is to deliver the best LQ to the customer. All right. Now, it's important for us because look. This one doesn't work here. All right. The Philippines, among all of these other countries, take a look at the total population uh, where we are still in the sweet spot, all right? Millennials will be key in winning emerging consumers, okay? And the crucial demographic, especially for fast-moving consumer goods companies, is to target value or to target adding value in U.S., Europe, and developed Asia Pacific. The good news is that U.S., we are under the U.S. GSP now. Good news about EU, we are under US, uh, EU GSP+. Plus. And talk about ASEAN. ASEAN has partnered with six large economies. So we have all the opportunities there. Now, let's go now to, uh, to uh, trade, uh, to, to, to flows. After a 20-minute uh, period, growing roughly uh, twice as fast as the global economy, global flows of goods, services, and finance roughly hit 30 trillion in 2007, peaking at 53% of global GDP. But we can see that this rapid expansion appears to have stopped in its tracks. I hope you can see it on the right side. Okay? So it has somewhat, it has somewhat uh, bounced back. But you can see that we have not quite recovered what we lost in the global financial crisis and what we now call as the Great Recession. Now, many observers point to this trend as evidence that globalization has stopped. But actually, MGI has a different view. Globalization has instead entered a new era defined by data flows that transmit information, ideas, and innovation. Digital platforms create more efficient and transparent global markets in which far-flung buyers and sellers find each other with a few clicks, taps, or swipes. The minimal or near zero marginal costs of digital communications and transactions open new possibilities for conducting business across borders on a massive scale. In the decade ahead, the global goods trade may continue to decline relative to world GDP. At a minimum, it is unlikely to resume rapid growth. Not only are factor costs changing, but what is the factor that we have to consider? 3D printing. This is a very big factor now. 3D, 3D printing and other technologies have also the potential to transform how and where goods such as electronics, vehicle parts, 
other transportation equipment, machinery and electrical equipment, medical instruments, and even apparel are produced. More on that later, because there's big news, for example, in Japan, they are able to sell 3D printed knitwear. Okay? You order it, and you can finish it in one day. All right, I'll move very quickly now, because I don't want to stand between you and your lunch. Basically, goods flows is described, you know, it, it has grown ten, ten and a half times from, uh, I think the year there is uh, 1980 to 2014. Services are, have grown also, in the case of flows, from 2002 to 2014, 3.1 times larger. But this is what's amazing. Cross-border data flows, cross-border data flows, okay, which have grown from 4.7 terabits per second in 2005 to 211.3 terabits per second or 45 times larger. The trade in goods has a lot of digital components. Of course, we know that services have a lot of digital component. You know, our services like our, our call centers, our knowledge process outsourcing. So we have entered the new era of digital globalization. The world is more interconnected than ever, and for the first time in history, emerging economies are counterparts on more than half of global trade flows. And South-South trade is the fastest growing type of connection, while flows of goods and finance have lost momentum and use crowder bandwidth has grown 45 times larger than 2005. It is projected to grow by another nine times in the next five years as digital flows of commerce, information, searches, video, communication, and intra-company traffic continue to surge. Globalization was once driven almost exclusively by government. And that's where I work. Large multinational corporations, and I think some of you are here present, and major financial institutions. But nowadays, artisans, entrepreneurs, app developers, freelancers, small businesses, and even individuals can participate directly on digital platforms with global reach. All right? More than ever before, Companies and countries cannot afford to ignore the opportunities beyond their own borders. MGI economic research indicates that global flow of goods, for, uh, foreign direct investment, and data have increased current global GDP by roughly 10% compared to what would have occurred in a world without any flows. This value was equivalent to 7.8 trillion US dollars in 2014 alone, and data flow, uh, flows account for 2.8 trillion of this effect exerting a large, larger impact on growth than traditional goods flows. This is remarkable, uh, where, for example, uh, given that uh, it was only a few years ago when this development was just in its nascent stage. Go global flows raised world GDP growth by 10% or 7.8 trillion. This is really great. So that said, Digital technologies or digitization changes the economics of globalization in several ways. As digital platforms become global in scope, they are driving down the cost of cross-border communications and transactions, allowing businesses to connect with customers and suppliers in any country. Globalization was once for large multinational corporations, but platforms reduce the minimum scale needed to go global, enabling small businesses and entrepreneurs around the world to participate, and as a result, new types of competitors can emerge from any corner of the world, increasing pressure on industry incumbents. Small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs worldwide, are uh, practically using plug-and-play infrastructure of internet platforms to put themselves in front of an enormous global customer base and become exporters. Amazon, for instance, now hosts some 2 million third-party sellers. In countries around the world, the share of SMEs that exports is sharp, sharply higher on eBay than among offline businesses com of comparable size. PayPal enables cross-border transactions by acting as an intermediary for SMEs and their customers. And participants from emerging economies are senders or receivers in 68% of cross-border PayPal transactions. 
Micro enterprises and projects in need of capital can turn to platforms such as Kickstarter, where nearly 3.3 million people representing nearly all countries made pledges in 2014. Facebook estimates that 50 million SMEs are on its platform, up from 25 million in 2013, and on average, 30% of their fans are from other countries. To put this number in perspective, consumer that the World Bank estimated that there were 125 SMEs worldwide in 2010, and so for small businesses in the developing world, digital platforms are a way to overcome constraints in their local markets. The ability of SMEs to reach global audiences supports economic growth elsewhere. I'll skip that already. Now we know about this already. Um, this, this is just comparing the people who are online using social media and the uh, various populations in the world. Okay, so it's not just corporates. Individuals can participate directly in globalization with significant economic impact. Thanks to social media and other internet platforms, individuals are forming their own cross-border connections. MGI estimates that 914 million people around the world have at least one international connection on social media, and 961 people around the world would have at least one international connection. 361 million participate in cross-border e-commerce, and these figures are growing rapidly. On Facebook, 50% of users now have at least one international friend. This share is growing even higher and faster among users in emerging economies. Now, what's digital like in the Philippines? Okay. Okay, you will see here countries that are building digital capacity, but we will see here that they are growing at uneven rates. Uh, the Philippines is considered to be in the standout, sorry, breakout. Now, to define these standout countries are those that have shown high levels of digital development in the past and continue to remain on an upward trajectory. Stall out countries are those that have achieved a high level of evolution in the past but are losing some momentum and risk falling behind. Breakout countries have the potential to develop strong digital economies through their overall score, though their overall score is still low, they are moving upward and are poised to become standout countries in the future. Watch out countries, on the other hand, face significant opportunities and challenges with low scores on both current level and upward motion of their uh, digital indices. Some may be able to overcome limitations with clever innovations and stopgap measures, while others seem to be stuck. Breakout countries such as India, China, Brazil, Vietnam, and the Philippines are improving their digital readiness quite rapidly, but of course, could be, we could develop even more. But the next phase of growth is harder to achieve. Staying on this tra trajectory means confronting the challenges like improving supply infrastructure and nurturing sophisticated domestic consumers. Right. We just, uh, well, McKinsey did a um, MGI or McKinsey uh, Global uh, Institute Connectedness Index, and you can see here that for all countries, uh, Singapore is number one, really a small country, but, uh, uh, and few natural resources, and yet they're number one. On the connected index, Connectedness Index, this is something that uh, MGI has put together uh, a couple of times already. It uh, measures the inflows and outflows of goods, services, finance, people, data, and weigh each other, and weigh them, weigh, weigh each of them equally. And we can see here where is the Philippines? The Philippines did not even make the first page. The Philippines is. You can't even see. Now you will see. The Philippines is number 54. Okay. So we still really have a long way to go. Right, so what is, what is digital in the Philippines? Digital in the Philippines, 100 million population, all right, 47.3 million are active internet users, active social media, 119.21 million mobile connections, 41 million active mobile social users. We have 87% uh, uh, mobile phone of all types, 55% of uh, smartphones, 43% of laptops, desktops, 24% uh, of tablets, 8% have streaming uh, devices. Well, uh, well, handheld is not included in the, sur uh, in the survey. E-reader devices, 5%, and, and um, wearable techni technical, uh, technological devices at 5%. Time spent with media, this is where we're good at. You see, 
Philippine social. I wish it were more commercial. All right? Five and a half, five hours and 12 minutes. All right? Average daily use of the internet. Three hours and 14 minutes. Average uh, daily use of the internet with a mobile phone. Three hours, 42 minutes. Social media with any device. And average daily television viewing time, two hours and 33. You will notice TV is getting less. Okay, the top active media social platforms, obviously, it's Facebook, Facebook uh, uh, Messenger, Google, Skype, etc. Mobile activities, um, you can see it there. Uh, percentage of uh, population uh, using mobile uh, uh, message messengers, 33%. Okay, uh, I guess I'll run through this very quickly already. E-commerce by device, 29% uh, uh, using um, uh, or, or purchased, or purchased uh, uh, via internet, 29% uh, and so on. I think I will have to skip this already. And I think you've seen this before from the presentation of BSP about the unbanked and banked uh, people in the Philippines. Okay, now I'll have to make a commercial. <laughs> This is the commercial of the Department of Trade and Industry. So what are we doing about this? We have a program called Slingshot. It is a thought-provoking, uh, you know, this is a national summit on startups and innovation. We will have thought-provoking keynotes on stage, interviews, high-impact meetups, and mentoring and extensive networking. This will be on April 21, 22. All right, and we will see some uh, kind of examples later on. Uh, the, the DDI, of course, has also launched the e-commerce roadmap uh, last February, and had we more, uh, if we had more time, I could have discussed that more. Okay. Now I just want to highlight this globalization then versus now. I was born in the 20th century. I was born in the 20th century, and there is a difference now between the 20th and 21st century. Tangible flows of physical goods. Now it's intangible flows of data and information. In the 20th century, flows mainly between advanced economies. Now, it's greater participation in emerging economies. Capital and labor intensive flows uh, last uh, century. Now, it's more knowledge intensive. Transportation infrastructure was critical. Now, digital infrastructure is more important. In the 20th century, um, multinational corporations dominated. Now, there's a growing role of small enterprises. Flows mainly made of, uh, of monetized monetized transactions. Now there are more exchanges of, of, uh, of uh, free content, okay, and services, all right? So you will see there that it's very, very different now. Innovation flows from advanced to emerging economies. Now innovation flows in both directions. Well, the world economy, well, the benefit, sorry, the benefit of globalization interconnectedness is that increases the ability of companies to get the best talent, the best ideas, the best inputs from anywhere in the world. It enables countries to specialize in what they do best. And this is where you will see here how globalization increases GDP and how digitization accelerates that and boosts that. All right? That said, I'll end my talk here because I'd like to show you a short video of two minutes on what we have, at least in the Philippines, by way of innovation as a new product that I hope you will be able to appreciate. Thank you very much. Tommy is early home from school. And he doesn't have a key. Your cleaning lady doesn't have a key. Cousin Rachel from out of town forgot her key. Luckily, your next door neighbor never got a key. Tommy will be home soon. It's a good thing you can always count on grandma. Or almost always. But hey, who needs a key? With a brand new Enterlock, you don't need to carry a key. And you don't have to wait home or worry about handing out spares. Because Enter turns your regular door into a super smart door. The Enterlock will unlock the door for the people you want in. With a smartphone. 
biometrically, with a remote or with a code. So people you don't want to let in are kept out. This revolutionary locking system is easily installed on every door to give you total control and total security. And of course, you can still open the door with a regular key. It's just not as fun. The new Enterlock. Enter the future of smart doors.